Hi, I'm Jill Hartz, the Executive Director of the Museum, and I want to thank all of you for coming. This is really wonderful, I, and, and I have to think this is because of Dean and our subject, and not that it's hot and hot outside. But it's great that you are in here. Um, we have a real treat in store for us. And I hope I'm, could I just see a show of hands of how many of you have been upstairs to see the gallery? Okay, so many, of about half of you, and the other half have a real treat in store. So if um, you don't get up there after the lecture today, there will be time, so you're welcome to do that. Do come back. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Emeritus Aideen McKenzie, who is a native Oregonian born in Pendleton. He received his BA from San Jose State University in 1952 and his MA from the University of California, Berkeley, where he specialized in ancient Greek and Roman art. He was awarded a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University in 1965. Over the years, Professor McKenzie has become a specialist in medieval art and Russian icons. He has published six books and numerous articles on Byzantine and Russian icons. He first taught for six years at New York University before coming to the University of Oregon, where he served in the position as a medievalist in the art history department. He also became a guest curator of our icon gallery and collections. With the expansion and renovation of the museum in 2005, Lucille and Dean very generously named the gallery that presents works from this collection. We are deeply grateful to both of you for your support. In conjunction with the exhibition of photographs of Russian churches in the McKenzie Gallery today, Professor McKenzie will discuss Russian Orthodox Church architecture. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you, Bill. That's a very nice introduction. Now if I can live up to it. <laughs> All right. What was that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm very, uh, very pleased to see what a good turnout we have today. I mean, it's, it's cool in here, of course. That does help. <coughs> but, um, and I only have a few notes here that, that didn't quite make it through the typewriter. In any case, um, I'd like to say that my uh, realm of the icons uh, goes back when I was uh, in uh, New York City and I was uh, putting together a PhD and uh, <coughs> got that degree there from New York University. But I won't go into any of the, that kind of background, but I want to uh, show you a very famous warrior. Anybody recognize him? All right, it's Constantine. Constantine. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few of them. Uh, well, you're close. Theodora. Uh, is of course a, a, a female, and that's very close though. Justinian was her, her husband, and that's a medallion, a gold medallion made uh, with his likeness. So next, <coughs> all right. There's a uh, a major uh, problem during the time of Justinian just like we find in uh, Egypt today. There was a uh, big brouhaha, you might say, among the people, and they were not very happy with their leader, Just Justinian. <coughs> and uh, so they were revolting, and they were uh, destroying the, the towns, 
of businesses and and uh, his wife here. This is Neil. Uh, this is the uh, recreation of the event <coughs> that went on with uh, Justinian and Theodora. And she was saying, now, if you want to escape and not have any uh, uh, major problems, why, you can leave. But actually, <coughs> as the uh, chronicler said, uh, that if you escape, you will no longer have any purpose in ruling another group. <coughs> so he, he got uh, brave and went out and told his uh, soldiers to uh, round up the, the riots into the uh, uh, entertainment fields. And they uh, shot down and, and killed thousands of, of people to put down this revolt. So that's what happens with this illustration. And, and he, uh, uh, according to the accounts, he followed her advice because she said a uh, golden uh, cloth is more important than trying to escape with your life. Well, uh, next. And here's a Hello? Can you hear? <coughs> the Byzantine Empire at, in 1028 was a smaller amount of land <coughs> than at the time of Justinian. And they were losing more territory. Uh, and we have in Western Europe, there's the German Empire and the uh, Kingdom of France, and what became Spain here in the south. <coughs> and uh, the uh, Russian area is now t taking uh, leave of their old land <coughs> and have decided to, um, the prince of Vladimir decided he would uh, uh, base his new uh, news uh, of the expanding Rus, <coughs> and they decided that uh, they would uh, be as a uh, well. Excuse me a little bit. I have a little problem with the with the. Uh, Projection here. Um, next uh, slide. <coughs> now, in Constantinople, which was named after Constantine the Great, and who was a little bit earlier than uh, the uh, well, this is the ground plan of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and it still stands today from the time of uh, Justinian, and he hired uh, the best architects he could find and produced a fantastic building with the dominant motif over the central space, uh, over the center of the, the building, over 100 feet in diameter, and half of these rounds, rounded areas, 
uh, extended it east and west. And this is out outside the entryway. <coughs> um, and uh, we have other expanded areas for uh, placement of mosaics. Uh, next. <coughs> All right, here is uh, Hagia Sophia again. The Holy Wisdom is the translation of the title. <coughs> and uh, they had to do a little construction here with these buttresses since there was an earthquake that caused the, uh, the cathedral to partially miss its dome at the top. So they built it on a higher level. Next. And that's just another one of my photographs of Hagia Sophia. This is the apse. This is the dome over the central space. And next. <coughs> and here's an architect's re recreation of the Church of Holy Wisdom. And you can see more clearly here the half domes and the full dome and 40 windows surrounding that central space. Uh, next. So uh, at this time, when we're moving ahead, uh, and uh, Vladimir had decided he would uh, base his, his new kingdom on a religious background, and this uh, recreation of this uh, Greek Orthodox priest holding a scroll, uh, he is um, trying to convince Vladimir that uh, the Christian ideal would be best for his new civilization. <coughs> And he's holding up this scroll in this painting version. And do you, any, anybody recognize this subject matter? The Last Judgment, yes, you got it. There's someone who's very, very alert at this sort of thing. So if you want to see the, the full decoration of, of the Last Judgment, uh, just look at this, next. That's a typical Russian last judgment image with Christ at the top and we have uh, Christ below here with Mary and John the Baptist and all these other figures that go down to the bottom of the scroll. So apparently Vladimir must have been a little bit sh shaken to uh, uh, think that this might be a way to escape punishment in the other world. Next. So he accepted the uh, Orthodox Christian beliefs and ordered to build an Hagia Sophia in his territory. Uh, he, uh, this is the model of the the church that he commissioned, and uh, that was more than one large dome and two half domes, but they had uh, uh, 21 domes. So they went way overboard. <coughs> so uh, this gives you an idea of what it originally looked like, and next. And here is inside of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And it shows uh, some of these 40 windows of the dome, which looks like it's floating up there in the air. And we have a pendentives uh, that were used to place the dome, the circular dome, over the square down below. Uh, this is not my photograph, but it's a very interesting one because of wide angle lens and this definitely looks like a floating balloon up in the sky with those 40 windows and then here's the apse of the of the cathedral 
Yeah, is that too dark for you? Well, I'm trying to s shine some light on the subject, so. <laughs> but this is better, actually. <coughs> All right, there you, you can see the idea of a floating uh, dome overhead. And there's, uh, they've excavated in this cathedral, especially after they turned it into a uh, museum. And before that, it was uh, uh, in Islamic belief. And one of my favorite art rep uh, representation of Christ is in this cathedral. And I want to show you, uh, it's coming up. This is in the apse of the uh, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And incidentally, I guess you probably know that Constantinople is named after Constantine the Great, number one. <laughs> and uh, here is the um, a development that had um, ramifications in iconography because there was the, uh, uh, a very strong dispute over whether they should be having these pictures of the saints or not. And so they had the iconoclastic controversy, which lasted for a couple of hundred years. This is to renew the, the illustrations of the saints. And this is about, I guess, about three, three times life size in the apse of the, the, uh, the church in Constantinople. And the one that I uh, especially like turned out very well. And this is Christ, but very human, human like in his expression. And uh, it appears representations of him in this fashion for uh, thousands of years. But notice the eye here on the left. It's looking right at you. But if you look at the other eye, it's looking away from you. And th th it has been described as an example of focus on the inside where the soul is rather than on the outside where the earthly realm is. Sounds like an interesting uh, supposition. Okay. <coughs> now here's another apse, like the one the Virgin and Child. And this is from uh, a detail from the Hagia Sophia in Kiev. And uh, so they built this uh, other holy wisdom uh, on the Nyesta River. And they uh, used a different technique than the, uh, the Greeks in Constantinople. And you can see they used the uh, bricks alternating with, with stone and with uh, also cement. A, a little bit sloppy type of work, but with uh, plaster you can cover up a lot. Next, next. Uh, I think we'll skip this one. <laughs> All right, here's a, a huge bell. I believe it was uh, was built in, uh, in 1862, thereabouts. <coughs> and it was meant to show the, uh, the Russians and how they have taken over this part of uh, uh, the eastern... Uh, part of uh, Europe, and the the figure holding up the cross is Vladimir, <coughs> and Rurik is uh, is over here. He was even earlier than uh, uh, Vladimir, and so these figures then represent the the, the famous the famous. Uh, and warriors of that time. Mm -hmm. Next.
All right, now here's a, a domed church as seen through an archway, it's an artistic device. <coughs> and you have the gilded domes and whatnot. And this is, uh, happens to be at Novgorod, which means uh, a new city, but it's a very old one. <coughs> uh, and this across this river is, the, is this uh, Hagia Sophia, that's uh, number three. And so uh, it was constructed on the basis that this is an important uh, arm of the Slavic Christian world. Next. And here's another National Geographic. And it shows uh, the populace of Russia and that they were made to go down to the Dnieper River and baptize themselves or with the Greek priests, according to this interpretation. This Greek priest and all, all the people of Kiev were uh, baptized then in the, in the river. And all the old idols were cast away and we have a new civilization then with the Russians. And they represented uh, and constructed and copied after many of the Greek churches, and they developed uh, a style of their own. Next. Uh, here's uh, a uh, architect's drawing of the, of the uh, Hagia Sophia in, in, uh, on the Dnieper River with the 21 domes. And next. And this is inside the cathedral of, of uh, Hagia Sophia once again. So they named three of these huge churches after the same saint, or holy wisdom to be exact. <coughs> and this is looking into the apse where the Virgin Mary appears. And up above there is uh, uh, a dome with uh, Christ at the top. And next please. And also mosaics in, in the uh, pendentives. You usually have four uh, writers. And what four, four writers would that be? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's inscriptions. You can just read it very carefully there. <laughs> it's not Greek. and Well, actually, it is Greek. And... Uh, it's not Slavic, though. And the, the image is a little bit awkward, the seated uh, figure. <coughs> and uh, it looks some, somewhat like uh, our modern civilization. <laughs> OK, and above that is the Pantocrator is the title for Christ as ruler of the universe. And this is uh, quite a different uh, style than the one we saw from Hagia Sophia <coughs> in uh, Constantinople. Put the light up. Can you see and hear better? All right. Okay, uh, if you want the first lesson in Greek, here it is. I C X C. What does that mean? It's an abbreviation for Jesus Christus. And you find that everywhere in the Eastern world of, of Christianity, 
that has to appear in the vicinity of Christ in his image. And also, Christ has to have a cross within his halo. Only he is allowed to use that feature. Next. All right, here's Hagia Sophia at Novgorod again. And use the mic. Use the mic. I guess I should lean on this lectern. Yeah. <coughs> All right, we have, uh, I think it's uh, five domes there, and uh, also the apses on the eastern section, and a, a kind of helmet dome was used in the early years. Next. And here's the St. George. And uh, we have, uh, I believe it's four domes there. And we have these uh, arches above smaller windows, with very thin windows. These are characteristic features of Novgorod churches and cathedrals. I'm going to show you this, several more details of this. This is the apse, where you have these three apse forms, very narrow windows, high drums, and uh, the cross at the top. Next. And this is the western entrance of the Church of St. George. And they use the three windows here and then single uh, windows on either side. Next. And this is sort of interesting, too. That's the same church, but they removed part of the plaster that was over the structure. And you can see that they uh, used rather sloppy work. There are some bricks, and there's uncut stone and plaster. So if I were they, uh, I wouldn't uh, show what kind of work they do. Next. And here's the ground plan. You can see that there is uh, uh, six of these piers that support the vaulting up above. And then the central space is reserved for uh, Christ as uh, ruler of the universe. And here's the main apses. Next. And here's looking up into the dome with Christ Pantocrator. The four evangelists. Next. Next. <coughs> now this is a nice photograph. In the winter time, I'd like to think that I, I uh, took that photograph, but I didn't. So. I won't take credit for it. It's a rather small church, and we're going to the uh, Sudal uh, region, eastern region of Russia, where these 12th century churches take the next step in development of Christian architecture. Next. And this is a photograph of the same church, and one of my students took this. I thought it was very mysterious because the the church above ground there is sort of washed out. But in the river down below, it's very as clear as a bell. Uh, next. And here's some more diagrams indicating uh, uh, the high proportions uh, narrow and high, and uh, down below here we have four piers supporting the upper head architectural forms, and the prince who would uh, attend church would be on this level, 
to, to take in the uh, service. So he's up above the people. Next. Now here's one very similar to it, but uh, here they've used a lot of sculpture. This is where Russian sculpture first comes out on these uh, R Russian churches. And we have these uh, columns, engaged columns, marking off three different divisions. And uh, helmet dome at the top, narrow windows. Uh, next. And here's a close view. This is all sculpted out of stone. And we have King David on a throne up here. The rest of the carvings were mostly plants and a few animals. And they re uh, also put some more decoration here in sculpture. And uh, next. Now we're moving to uh, Moscow and going to the uh, center of, of Moscow where the Kremlin is. And uh, they have these uh, large cathedrals <coughs> that uh, uh, became the most important churches in the Russian realm. And uh, they, uh, this particular building is the Dormation Cathedral. And here's a side entrance to this uh, cathedral. And here's an icon screen. And here we have uh, four of the six uh, for the vaulting. And here's uh, some domes. The chapels uh, on the sides, on this side of the um, iconostasis or iconostas. I have two chapels on one side and two on the other side. So it becomes a little more complex. Next. All right, this is uh, the same church on the outside, and they had uh, constructed this church about this level, where you have these colonnades and engaged columns, and uh, helmet-like domes at the top, and very narrow windows. And uh, the building almost collapsed and they had to call in some other architects to uh, uh, do a better job. So they went to Italy and they found uh, an Italian architect uh, who uh, was talked into going with the uh, Russian envoy. <coughs> and uh, he apparently was su such a bright person that they called him, nicknamed him, Aristotle. So he must have been very bright. All right, next. The same uh, cathedral, have some fresco paintings underneath these pochki. And um, the same features that we've been seeing. Where is it? It's Mos Moscow. And uh, and it's uh, in, inside the, the walls. Next. And yet another uh, picture of the same c cathedral of the Dormition with engaged columns and the narrow, very narrow windows, upper level. And it turned out very well, uh, thanks to uh, Aristotle. Fidel Banti is his last name. And this is inside uh, the Kremlin. Next. And the, the same church, and here we have uh, a very large fresco painting 
but it's not too well seen because of the uh, the botchka cast the shadow over the image. But you can see the Archangel Michael and Gabriel. Next. And that's inside the Dormition Cathedral. And it's uh, quite impressive. All these chandeliers. And this is the icon screen, which uh, the Russians call the uh, icon stas. And you can see the procession of the saints, the, uh, the various special events, and others that uh, were added on. Next. All right, here's uh, very close to the Dormition is uh, this Annunciation Cathedral. These are all cathedrals. And this one has more gold than usual. Uh, and it has uh, flat uh, pilasters, different levels. Next. And inside of this uh, Annunciation is uh, one of the most important icon screens, which uh, dates back to the uh, 1400s. And it was Andrei Rublev, who uh, was a major painter, who painted these figures of John the Baptist, the Virgin Mary, the archangels, and then uh, special events in the Christian world, and so forth. Next is the ground plan of the uh, Annunciation Cathedral. And I had to put in the red dots because they had left that out. But you have, uh, let's see, four, eight uh, golden domes. Next. Yeah, now that's an interesting little church. Ah. Well, in fact, it has been made out of cake, <laughs> but, but only portions of it. It's Kolomenskoye on the outskirts of uh, Moscow. And uh, those, uh, that's actually cake decoration on, on that uh, dome. And it was one of my students, so that's why it's such a first rate job. Next, here's the real one, and it's very, very close to it. The mic. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good. So this, uh, this is a very interesting type of uh, building, and uh, it was meant to to show that they can build these churches uh, as they would be tents. And that was uh, later uh, became taboo. <coughs> but there's uh, a botchki acting as buttresses. And they have steps wa uh, walking up to the upper level. And it's been whitewashed, so it, it looks better than just red. Next. And here's the uh, steps leading up to the upper level. And we have these uh, pointed arches that become very characteristic during this period. And that's the 15th, 16th period. OK, next. Here's the ground plan. You can see how thick these walls are to keep them from bursting forth. Uh, and uh, they also use that for signal uh, signals to other parts of the realm. 
and you can see the staircases leading up from different directions and over here and down here. Next. Everybody knows this one. St. Basil's, yes. And uh, we have uh, the most picturesque of the uh, these uh, churches and was meant to um, advance the development of church decoration. All this, <laughs> all these uh, colors were actually put on a, a, a hundred years later than it was built. So it must have been rather plain originally. And there's one of these tent domes. And here's, uh, we have a, a new type of, of, of dome. Next. Now here's a very interesting one. It has these botchki supports. And this leads up to a tent-like shape. Next. And then right at the very top is the cross. And Lukovica is the term they use for these uh, uh, domed structures. Onion, yes. Yeah, they did. Yeah, Luk Lukovica. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, they they thought that was their <laughs> word anyway. <laughs> so these are uh, Lukovicas, and that's it. It says onion. <laughs> Next, here's a ground plan of Saint Basil's. And they have uh, staircases going up to the second level. That's, that's traditional because of the uh, weather situation. To, to, uh, they often have floods in the basement. And so we have here the uh, largest towers. There's one, two, three, four. And then we have four smaller ones. One, two, three, four and then one in the center. So it's quite an extensive development of the, the dome system. Next. Here's some really fancy ones. It's still St. Basil's. And uh, they painted the brick with uh, whitewash and then painted the flowers over that. Next. Cross section, you can see the basement here. You have to keep out of that part of the building. And here's the smaller domes. Uh, the, each one has its own icon screen, and then the larger ones, and the tent dome. Next. Anybody recognize this character? Who? Paul? Paul? No, he's uh, Rasputin, no. <laughs> it's Ivan, or Ivan, oh, Ivan the Great. <laughs> terrible, she says it's a terrible one. <clears throat> but the, what's interesting, especially interesting about this uh, portrait is this is the beginning of portraiture in Russia. And so it was painted as if it were an icon. The icon style was used. And uh, that was in the late 40s. And uh, he's something you might dr dream about. <laughs> what? The 1940s, 1840s. <laughs> Which 40s? 40s, 19. Uh, 
Well, he he was uh, born uh, at the time they were decorating this this uh, cathedral, and the Kolomenskoye was a dedication to Ivan the the uh, the evil one. Next. What century? Uh, it was uh, from. Uh, it was to be nineteen. Wait a minute here. Got a little confused. Fourteen hundreds. Has to be yeah. And uh, that's a closer view of it. Next. There's his eye. Doesn't look very uh, realistic, but Big Brother is watching you. Next. Here's uh, Ilya Repin, uh, one of the greatest Russian painters, uh, depicted this scene, which has to do with Ivan the Terrible. And he was having a very heated discussion with his eldest son, who was next in line to the throne. And he became so violent that he killed his son. But he didn't, he didn't really intend to do that. And you can see his staring eyes and his son collapsing to the floor. Well, Ivan the Terrible was terrible in many ways. And this is one of the ways that he was terrible. Next. All right, this is uh, going back into uh, Basel's, uh, St. Basel. And uh, this was the largest of the icon-bearing rooms in that, in that church. And uh, we had some very early paintings there of the icons. And that goes back to the 1400s. And here's uh, the lineup of, of the saints and the events they were involved with. And it's the same, basically it's the same composition you find in every Orthodox church. Here's Christ enthroned, Virgin Mary, the uh, Archangel um, Gabriel, Saint Saint Peter, and then we have these uh, festival scenes, Old Testament Trinity, uh, and. Uh, Baptism of Christ, and so forth. Next. And there's one more uh, of these chapels with uh, uh, the icon screen and put in the same places each time. Uh, these are the royal doors. Only the priests or the uh, um, highest official in the government were allowed to go in and out of these these uh, uh, doors. Next. All right, now we're going to shift gears and go from uh, from the, uh, uh, the warmer south to the north, the wooded area. <clears throat> and uh, what they used there basically for the construction of the the churches is is wood <clears throat> and this uh this photograph shows the ground plan of the oldest surviving wooden church and that would be 14th century and uh, 
the smallest space here is is uh, for the uh, ceremonies that were officiating. And here's the uh, icon screen and the meeting uh, of the people in the larger space, and then finally the larger, uh, the three. Next. And here's what it looks like uh, in the flesh. Of course, they had, they had changed uh, quite a few of the uh, wooden constructions there. And they, uh, they used to use logs, but uh, they used flat boards later on. Next. Contapolga is the name of this very interesting <coughs> um, cathedral. And we have a model of it on the back uh, table, if you want to see that later. Next. Here's another view of that same church. Very vertical. And use of octagon for building up higher and higher. Next. Here's another one that's uh, near an old growth. <coughs> and it has a raised porch quite a ways up with the octagon supporting the, the, the dome at the top. Next. Now there's a nice scene, isn't it? Really cool. I did not take this photograph, but someone did, and they did a good job. You can see there's tracks, so you didn't have to walk. And this is on the island, uh, not far from Novgorod. And let's have the second one next. Here's the, the biggest one of these, these structures. 22 domes made by one carpenter. And they're constantly repairing it because the wood rots away. But it's a, it's a big experiment and it basically it, it succeeded. Next. And here's the same church in the diagrams. And you can see from this angle that the ceiling is only about nine feet high. And that's because uh, if they left it open for air going up, up to the top, it wouldn't be preserved very well. Yes, uh -huh. I wouldn't tell you anything else. <laughs> That's, those are all, uh, what they call them, shake, uh, wooden slot, shake. And this, uh, the ground plan here at the left shows where the icon screen is, and there's where the congregation meets. And come, they come up the steps again to the second floor. Next. And here's the icon screen that goes overboard. But all the saints are there. Next. All right, now we take a big jump from the wintry scene up in the north. I think we need a little focus on that one. Now this is uh, the 1700s. And this is basically like uh, some of those 12th century uh, churches, except they have all this decoration. It looks almost like porcelain with light blue and gold and, and uh, irregular domes. But we can see that the influence, especially of Italy, uh, on the development of 
uh, Russian churches. Where do you think that influence came from? And, and whose fault is it? Peter the, Peter the Great, yes, exactly. He was the one that even went on his own excursions to Holland and elsewhere and learned the trades, uh, especially the shipping trades and all that, and brought facts to Russia, uh, builders that he knew it would influence the, uh, uh, the people at that time. Next, there's the detail. <clears throat> All these curves and uh, imitation, vegetation, and whatnot, uh, show a very ro rococo style. Next. All right, now we're coming back to the United States. And this is a Russian cathedral. And it has a tower in the front. And these uh, cushion uh, Lukovica. And I thought this was really quite an interesting photograph. Here's the uh, cemetery. But I took this photograph, and if you look very closely, what's up on top? Bald eagle, Bald eagle exactly. That's right, exactly, exactly. No, not everybody can take that picture. Maybe it's Alaska, huh? Unalaska. Dutch Harbor. Dutch Harbor. Dutch Harbor, Harbor Alaska. Yeah. Next. And here's uh, a slip slide. Uh, this is the inside of that church, and it's, it's the... Uh, um, longest surviving Russian church. And this is the icon screen that they use. They use canvas and oil paints and uh, quite a different style than the earlier period. Next. Here's Bishop Gregory. I was his guest for a while. This is in Sitka, yes. Next. And this is also in Sitka, and it's a miraculous icon, Christ and his mother. <coughs> the Virgin of Kazan. <coughs> Does that ring a bell for someone here? <laughs> he should speak up. <coughs> but see, here's the realistic style, Renaissance style, in the 19th century. <coughs> which uh, was the trend at that time until the, the 20th, and then they were going back to the older style, the more abstract. Next. Now, where's this? San Francisco, San Francisco yes. <laughs> San Francisco, and so we have five domes there. Elongated forms. Uh, of architecture, which derive from the older ones. And inside, next, you look up into the dome, what do you see? If that's Christ, why is he wearing white hair, like John here? Well, apparently, at uh, the time they, they built this, uh, they approved the theme, uh, which is not Christ with white hair, uh, but it refers to other references in the Bible. And uh, this would be the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days. That's why he looks so old. But uh, the uh, artists who decorated this cathedral 
uh, did some really interesting things. Next. Who's this? Yeah, exactly, St. George and the Dragon. And here he is spearing the dragon, rescuing the, the princess, and the king and queen send down the, the keys to the, the city in reward for George. Is that inside the San Francisco one? Yes, it is. It, and that's the big one. There's another one across town. North, the north side. But my favorite inside this cathedral is the next photo. Elijah ascending into the heavens. Yeah. Isn't that dramatic? And here's Elijah. He throws down his robe. Elijah is waiting for it. Okay, next. All right, this is the last photograph. It's Peter the Great. <coughs> and uh, he was the one that changed the whole orientation of the Russian people. Russian people. Uh, and uh, that's why I show it as the last picture. He's not even using uh, uh, the Russian language on the on the stone, which uh, acts like a, a wave of the future. So I think that's all we have.
pointed to the direction of restoring these part of these final great paintings of architecture you know, while, while they can. Does the University of Oregon, what is the scan of the icons in the U of O's collection, chronologically or culturally? Uh, well, it, it stayed pretty much the same. But I've brought about uh, other owners of icons to get them to donate icons to this collection. So uh, that, over the years that when I came here, uh, I helped uh, expand that collection. You've done a wonderful job. I want to thank you as a U of O grad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. There's one, uh, one book, I think there's one book that, 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 that one of the cultures that also had a column that was also covered with icons. Is that the that, 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 that picture? Did you see that one? Uh, which one was that? No, it's the interior shoes, the interior of the, and the column, everything's painted up. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, the cylindrical columns that support the, uh, and they paint the, the, the saints on them. There's a place for each one of the saints. And they fill up the entire church. And you might want to take a look at the photograph I took in the DC recently. Uh, and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're, I guess it's fairly new. Orthodox Christian um, cathedral, and they have everything covered on all the, all the walls, and and you could tell, and they were very realistic at the same time, so you could tell exactly who it is that they're representing, not just the, the people of the past. So, Dean, do you have us copy some um, plans of churches, right? that yeah, are yeah, here for people. Happens, no, they're back here. Oh, back so here. I just wanted to say, right, that we have copies of these for you to take with you. So if you take a moment and look at some of the models, um, when you talk to Dean individually, there are also some takeaways. So just wanted to let you know that you know you're here. Right? <laughs> and maybe we should thank you again. Thank you.